potentially an exciting time. We do need a lot more network bandwidth. In this issue of the communications that I was just reading today, there's a table at the end that compares worldwide network traffic over the last three years to see what the effect of, of the COVID pandemic has had. And it, it looks like in, in many areas, traffic has been up at least 30 to 40% over previous years because of so many people sitting as we're now doing and having video conversations and meetings and so on. Uh, but we need a lot more bandwidth. And I'll just give an example of where bandwidth is still grossly inadequate. Uh, my university a couple of years ago did a study of how much data does our campus actually have. And uh, because some of us have argued for years that we really have a corporate responsibility to, to ensure that this data is backed up preferably in multiple places, geographically distributed, so no local natural disaster can wipe out the backups. Well, we have about 25 petabytes and our Center for High Performance Computing has done extensive studies in how fast you can upload data to the various cloud services. And although there's a lot of fluctuation, uh, we do have some of the fastest network hardware in the world because we're part of the original five founding members of the ARPANET. And um, a good round figure is about a terabyte a day. And now you say, well, I have 25 petabytes. That means 25,000 days. That's roughly 70 years just to copy our data offsite once. But of course, what we want to do is copy it offsite multiple times and replicate it. So we need something of the order of a 10,000 fold increase in network bandwidth before uh, Offsite backups for large organizations, companies, universities, government branches, and so on really become feasible. Um, and uh, clearly, uh, optical communications are the way to go. Um, you can have multiple optical fibers in a rather tiny bundle, and you can also do these tricks of using different wavelengths to encode data on so that you can get really a tremendous amount of data pushed down a fiber very quickly. But it all requires uh, an enormous worldwide effort and tremendous support from telecommunications companies and governments and other organizations. So it's not going to happen in a hurry, but it's an indication of what are the future needs of network bandwidth. And if you were suddenly uh, in possession of networks that work 10,000 times faster than they do today, now the blink of an eye is has become a microsecond um, for, for things of the type we're talking about. And so I think there's lots of room for technological growth. Continuing this little diversion, um, the tech obviously has a strong relationship to the, the university library, the academic library, libraries generally. And uh, there's a very interesting problem problem called a uh, so software project called LOCKS, L-O-C-K-S-S. Lots of copies keep stuff safe. And they have a community around them and they've moved on a bit since I last heard, did anything with them. But they are, uh, what's, what's the word, um, relevant in this picture because they're people with whom we should have a good relationship. If, if we can say, if tech archives well, let's put it that way, then that's a big plus. So one of the things I'm quite keen about, and there's been discussion on it from the, I think it's the GUNIX, GUNIX project, um, which is reproducibility, re reproducible bills for software. So the executables, when you build an executable, you should always get the same outcome from the same sources. That, that's the idea, which means, of course, that you can't put the build date in the software. You have to store it somewhere else. Um, but this, this idea of having reproducible results is part of being able to guarantee integrity without doing a byte by byte copy or anything else like that. You can simply say, it has this checksum, we trust the checksum can't be forged, just give me something else with the same checksum and I'll leave it. 
uh, that, that's roughly how it goes. Um, I came across it recently because the squash file system, uh, which is one way of publishing a Git repository with thousands and thousands of branches with lots and lots of commonality without having an enormous blow up of space. The squash file system, uh, the latest version, generates reproducible builds by default. You can do it a bit quicker if you can do the build a bit quicker if you don't insist on it be re reproducible. But then two different systems will get different results. And you know, if I say these are my inputs, this is my script, this is my output, you'd like to be able to generate the same output from the same inputs and the same script. And that's really the thing about reproducibility is that you can trust my answer because you, you're guaranteed to get the answer. Uh, this is the thing that people either, some people like and some people hate when they start learning mathematics, which is that when you're doing arithmetic, there's only one right answer. And, and the teacher can mark it wrong without looking, mark, mark your answer as wrong without looking at your working, just, just by looking at what you've written then. Um, uh, my father worked in aeronautics and he had five figure log tables. Uh, that extra figure makes it, I think, makes the log tables about 10 times bigger. So we were given homework to do uh, on the use of logarithms. And I would do my homework using my father's more precise log tables and got told off by the teacher for doing that because it made more work for him because he couldn't just check the answer because I would sometimes come up with what I've done. So, so, um, so that's reproducible computations. And I think Don Knuth rightly says that if you can get it, it's a very important value. Um, so in, a, in some sense, um, my goals for tech in the browser are to extend the reproducibility to yet another platform and a platform that is very widely available.